Good morning. Great. All right, let's get going. Uh, blood circulating. Uh, a lot of exciting things to do today together. So, uh, my name is Chris Bray. I chair the Senate Natural Resources and Energy Committee, and I also have the um, pleasure of serving today on this panel with you all uh, up here to talk about uh, beneficial electrification and an evolving role for utilities in this energy efficiency in the state of Vermont. Um, you know, time's our most precious thing that we have to spend, and so I'm really thankful that you're spending your time here uh, with all of us today at this panel and other panels. Um, and in order to make it productive, I'd like to uh, think of this panel not as just an information sharing, but as a training session. Uh, because the implication with training is that when you leave, you're going to use that training to do something. Uh, and the reason I'm thinking more about the, the notion of connecting it to getting something done is that uh, I'm sensing this summer and fall a greater than ever a sense of urgency to make progress on climate and environmental issues. And um, I don't know if people have that same feeling or not. All right, you're pretty quiet on that. Um, the, uh, the, you know, I, for instance, uh, just one small data point. The, the largest demonstration in Burlington's history in decades was for the climate strike just a week ago. So there is, I think, a much broader, deeper uh, shared sense of the need to make uh, tangible progress. Um, and at the same time, though, I hear in my own language talking to my colleagues, peers, the public, almost an apologetic note um, when I'm trying to talk about climate and environmental issues, something along the lines of, you know, I hate to bother you, um, that planet is on fire, can we talk about climate for a minute? And, and yet, um, that to me feels like having my weight in my heels. It's a weak position to make an ask and uh, to do work with people from. So I'd like to find, I am experimenting with finding ways to get my weight forward, to lean into the work, to be comfortable saying that we need to be comfortable, all of us, saying that there's more work to be done sooner. And uh, so I want to do an experiment with you all. And that is the first thing it sounds, so first if everyone could stand up. We'll see how this goes. It may be uh, something that we can all use after. So I was an EMT, and I was trained to respond to emergencies. It's nothing dramatic in a certain way. Uh, the alarm sounds. You travel to the scene. You use your training to walk into an emergency that may involve fire, car wrecks, screaming, blood, mayhem. Uh, and then you quietly focus and uh, take steps designed to save lives. And that's it. That's the job. So when I look at the environment, I see an emergency. Um, the alarm is sounding, you know, it's like in the Midwest, three floods in 10 years that are labeled once in 500 year floods, or Greenland's ice shelf melting last on August 3rd, enough water was released to fill 4.4 million Olympic swimming pools in a day, uh, 80 million pools in the month. Uh, the Bahamas got this devastated by Dorian, and you see the photos, it looks like some sort of monstrous weed whacker came through and, and decimated the microphone and the island. So there is a, a lot of uh, alarms going off. And so I'd like to borrow, the frame I'm talking about today is borrowing from EMTs and uh, thinking, talking, and acting. So the first thing is that I hope we can all get comfortable when we work and when we talk with our peers on saying in a clear and unapologetic uh, way that we have an environmental emergency. Not a particularly dramatic statement, but clear and emphatic. It's acknowledging the situation right in front of us. So this is a repeat after me moment, uh, you know. I'd like us all to just say, we have an environmental emergency. Ready, set, your turn. We have an environmental emergency. I'm trying to get comfortable using that language, and I hope we all can, seriously. The next thing is when you're an EMT, so you get to this emergency, um, and then you act. And so the next thing I would say is, using my training, I will take appropriate and necessary action. 
And that's why I'm calling this training today. So let's try that one together. Using my training, I will take necessary and appropriate action. That's it. Great. Thank you. Please take your seats. I'll encourage you to investigate using that language as you continue your work um, so we can all lean into this because we need to work faster. Leaning on, holding on to that EMT frame of mind, um, I think about this panel is becomes not just information but training so we can take appropriate and necessary action in the coming year. And um, so I want to thank everyone for standing up, for speaking aloud, uh, for leaning in. And now to help us with a training, I would like to introduce two great trainers in the state of Vermont. Uh, they are Rebecca Foster, who's director of Efficiency Vermont, and Joni uh, Sliger, a fellow at the Regulatory Assistance Project. So they're here to train us on how to redefine efficiency in order to eliminate greenhouse gases through beneficial electrification. So with that, I'm going to take my seat and please welcome Rebecca Foster. Pardon me, Joni's going first. Thank you, Senator Bray. It's a pleasure to join you all today. As he said, my name is Joni Sliger, and I am a fellow at the Regulatory Assistance Project. Some of you may know us, but for those who don't, we're an independent, nonpartisan NGO uh, headquartered here in Vermont, and we're dedicated to accelerating the transition to a clean, reliable, and efficient future. I'm particularly pleased to be speaking with you today on efficiency. It's a matter near and dear to the heart of RAP and to many of those who work there. Um, several of my colleagues were uh, working at when it was called the Public Service Board in Vermont, uh, when the energy efficiency utility was being developed. Um, and in the interest of full disclosure, it's still a topic that we work on today. One of my colleagues is the chair of the board at VEIC. Um, so, working on it in his free time. I'm not here to talk about either of those. I'm here to talk about some of what RAP has been thinking about, about how we can reapproach energy efficiency in a way to help eliminate climate pollution. So, RAP has a saying efficiency is the answer. Now, what's the question? That has been true for decades. Efficiency is our least cost resource. When we make cost-effective cost investments in energy efficiency, it saves money. It saves money for ratepayers, the utility, and society as a whole. Um, this graphic is what we lovingly refer to as the layer cake of benefits from energy efficiency. Um, so I want to assure you that in talking about redefining energy efficiency today, it's not to say that it no longer has value or place. That is, the opposite of that is true. It's just a question of how do we frame the question. So, first today I'm gonna to talk about how we might redefine it, how we might reapproach it and think differently. Then I'm gonna follow that with a beginning to think about what the implications of that are. So. Generally speaking, across this country and in many others, we've tended to approach energy efficiency in terms of a single fuel. Many of our policies are aimed at increasing energy efficiency in using electricity, in using natural gas, in using gasoline, in using a host of other fuels. And Apologies. Um, we call it energy efficiency, but you could call this single fuel efficiency, maybe electricity efficiency. Today we're going to talk about being a little broader than that. So when we talk about energy efficiency, we mean energy. We mean all fuels because that is how we can see savings. Um, and I have an example here on the screen. If you take a gallon of gasoline in an average gas car, that can take you maybe 25 miles, maybe a little more today, it depends. But that gallon of gasoline represents a certain amount of energy, a certain amount of joules. 
And if you had that same amount of energy in electricity instead, it could actually get you farther in an electric powered vehicle uh, when this was done over 100 miles. In short, for the same amount of input, you can get a greater amount of output. There are efficiency savings that can be realized from recognizing differences in the type of fuel. This doesn't necessarily mean, and I don't want to be um, claiming that, you know, the solution is easy, electrify everything. It's a little more complicated than that. At RAP, we like to refer to this as beneficial electrification. And what that means is electrification measures that are efficient, but that still comply with some traditional tests we've done. Do they save ratepayers money? Are they environmentally helpful, beneficial? Is it benefiting the grid through maybe improving grid management? We say it doesn't necessarily need to meet all three of these, but certainly it shouldn't harm any of those objectives. If it can save consumers money and be neutral on the other two, we'd still call that beneficial. But at the heart of it, smart investments in efficiency are what we see as the path forward. Now, to take a step back, why we're here today and talking about electrification in the first place is because our electricity system is getting far cleaner, has a lot farther to go, but certainly as a fuel, it can provide greenhouse gas reductions relative to some other fuels that we use today. And if we can reapproach efficiency as a tool to help us best use those, it will help us achieve those greenhouse gas reductions. We call this energy optimization. It's the key to making decarbonization affordable because it lets us use low cost and low emission fuel sources in when and where they are available to get an optimal result. Now, as I mentioned, that's kind of a rethinking of energy efficiency from before. If we switch from having that gas car, taking that gallon of gasoline, having it as an electricity instead, and powering that electricity powered vehicle, that is an increase in electricity consumption. It might be all fuels efficient, but it's a change. And because of that, there are certain implications and barriers that we need to be aware of in implementing that new approach. Several of these are the current policies that we have in place. Uh, Commonly across the country, we've tended to frame uh, even ward legislation and policies on how efficiency should be done in terms of single fuels. You, electric utility, you need to achieve this many reductions in kilowatt hours consumed. You need to achieve this reduction in a percentage of your sales. Like I said, electricity efficiency. Some other policies we've had, and in many places continue to have, are what we call prohibitions on load building or fuel switching. Um, what this means is you electric utility or most other utilities um, in general, increasing your sales of your product through the use of ratepayer money is not something you're allowed to do. In a world where we can think of all fuels efficiency, of energy optimization as something that helps us move towards affordable decarbonization, policies like these need to be updated. There are several states that have begun to do this. So, the state of Massachusetts is one of, I believe, 27 states in the country that has an energy efficiency resource standard. It is framed, the goals, in terms of uh, 
reductions in consumption of the fuel, but they also have requirements to meet in terms of their overall energy usage. They have targets that are framed in million metric British thermal units. <coughs> Similarly, in California, just this past August, they updated the test they had on fuel switching, a test they originally adopted in 1992, um, to make it easier to, for efficiency administrators to implement measures that are efficient but that require the switching from one regulated fuel to another. And I want to bring this back to really talk about decarbonization and how this is affordable with another example. Um, the Sacramento Municipal Utility District in California uh, incidentally not subject to that fuel switching test that was recently updated, uh, has adopted greenhouse gas reduction goals that are stronger than the state of California's. And it's aiming to reach those goals, not through 100% electricity, which they have not yet realized uh, how to do that cost effectively, but to have a mix of cleaner, electricity and targeted investments in other areas to realize greenhouse gas reductions in other sectors. Helping their consumers move to electrified vehicles, helping them adopt electric appliances like water heaters and space heaters. And by doing this, they have run that analysis, seen the data, and are aiming to become net zero by 2040. Like I said, um, Regulatory Assistance Project has been working on these issues for a while, and we have several exciting publications that have come out recently. Uh, I'm here today talking about redefining energy efficiency, which I'm happy to say was a topic that we were recently able to publish an article on in the Electricity Journal. Um, I bring that up in particular to highlight, because right now is the open access period where you can get a copy of it for free. Uh, best way to do that is uh, follow one of the links. Uh, John Cheneau, one of my colleagues, recently wrote a blog on energy optimization on our website. It has links not only to the article that I was involved in, but to all of the others in the journal which we helped on or co Um And many others that I uh, highly recommend, although <laughs> not although. Apologies. I was not involved in these others, but there's a host of resources. Like I said, I'm a fellow at RAP. I have deeply enjoyed learning everything I can, and I think they have a wealth of information that can be helpful. So, thank you. trouble with the uh, One moment. PowerPoint. Could somebody come up and help with the AV? The mouse. The mouse. The mouse. The mouse. Oh. It's not the mouse. Oh, the mouse pad might be off. Oh, I don't know. I don't know. We'll get it. Don't worry. Oh. So in the interim, um, like I said, RAP works across the country and around the globe. Uh, I myself, I've worked in various places, but I'm relatively new to Vermont, um, and I look forward to learning more from both the others on the panel and from you all about what some of the issues are that you see here in Vermont or in the state that you're visiting from to talk about them. Oh, here we go. Oh, we got it. I found it. Actually, it's not the same slide. Okay. Now that you have it. Yeah, there we go. Okay, so which one is this? Yeah. 
this one. Yep. Wonderful. Let's see if it shows up. No slideshow from beginning. Perfect. Great. Wonderful. All right. Thank you. With that out of the way, there'll be no more technical glitches, I'm sure. Um, so I'm Rebecca Foster, Director of Efficiency Vermont, and I'm really happy to be here today to talk about efficiency at a renewables conference. You know, what, what's that all about? Um, thank you to Rev for having us here. Thank you to Senator Bray uh, for your leadership on these topics, um, and really welcome the opportunity to talk about how a redefinition of efficiency might get us further toward achieving the climate goals that the renewables and efficiency uh, industries all share together. So I want to start with a little bit of um, background information, so I apologize if folks are fully aware of all of this, but just in case, I want to talk for a moment or two about Efficiency Vermont's work. Um, we were created by an act of the legislature back in 1999 uh, and have been operating since 2000. Um, before Efficiency Vermont was created as a statewide entity, the utilities in the state were offering uh, efficiency programs and were you know, kind of quite different across the different territories. Um, the contractors, retailers, the supply chain um, were somewhat challenged by um, those different programs and you know, complying with program requirements and knowing what products to promote and knowing what rebates were out there. So Efficiency Vermont was created uh, to bring statewide equity, statewide scale, and statewide consistency to efficiency programs. We were the first in the nation energy efficiency utility. Now we're one of three in the state. Burlington Electric Department operates in Burlington, and Vermont Gas Systems uh, operates in its territory to bring efficiency services to gas customers. And we're focused on demand-side management, so really bringing clean energy technologies out to Vermont's homeowners, businesses, renters, low-income customers. Um, and we do this through education, technical assistance, incentives, and really you know, trying to break down the barriers that keep people from moving forward adopting uh, clean energy and efficient technologies. We're operated by an organization called VEIC, Vermont Energy Investment Corporation, and overseen by the Public Utility Commission. So that's who we are. Um, a little bit about the history. Um, years ago, when Efficiency Vermont was founded, um, there were, was a pretty different electrical system, uh, energy system, than there is today. Uh, at that point, uh, the legislature set up very distinct roles between um, the distribution utilities charged with delivering safe, reliable, affordable power out to customers, and the energy efficiency utilities helping customers to reduce their energy usage and reduce cost. And you know, now, kind of thinking about you know, what's changed, uh, we have those lines blurring a bit. I'll talk about that in a moment. Um, but back when Efficiency Vermont was created, um, really the environment that we were working within was that every megawatt hour of electricity usage was deemed to have an environmental cost and an economic cost, and the state policy was to go out and reduce megawatt hours. You know, that was Efficiency Vermont's target. That was our goal. Um, and it worked. We've had you know, a lot of success over the years achieving that goal, um, including $2.4 billion worth of cost savings for Vermonters, 11 million uh, metric tons of greenhouse gas reduction since we began work. And then now, um, over 16% of Vermont's electricity needs are met by efficiency. So set a different way, that means without efficiency as part of our system, Vermont would need to purchase, transmit, and distribute 16% more electricity than we do now. Um, so this is a success story. Um, and um, that success has really happened over the past 20 years while many other changes were going on in the energy system. So I'm going to talk a little bit about some of those. Um, first, renewable electricity. So we've heard today um, that renewables are really a growing part of our electric mix. Statewide, um, that's about 63% um, renewable electricity with some utilities already at 100% renewable and others um, setting targets and setting goals to get there in the next few years. And that's f fantastic. It's thanks to many of you here in this room. Um, and we know as the electricity sector gets more and more renewable, um, the EIN report from last year kind of just paves the way to you know, share with us uh, the work that's still needed in the other sectors of our energy economy, transportation and heating in particular. So that brings about a bit of a shift in how we think about our energy challenges. 
The second big um, change that I want to draw attention to is electrification, as Joni just said. So we have, um, I think, two pushes toward that here in Vermont. One, the fact that electricity uh, is a more renewable fuel. Um, and then second, we have the advent of more efficient electric technologies for home heating, water heating, vehicles. So um, those two things together really bring about a push toward electrification, uh, which the utilities are leading on through their really excellent tier three programs. Uh, and then uh, the third is the advent of smart devices. So um, controllable devices for homes, for businesses, for large customers that really help us understand and then control when energy is used. So these have the promise with widespread deployment uh, for helping customers match their usage to times when renewables are plentiful on the electric grid. Um, and that's going to take a big push, but you know, if we can do that, uh, we have the potential to really decrease our greenhouse gas uses. So these be three big trends are kind of happening out um, in front of customers. They're shaping our state policy. Um, there is another trend in the background that I do want to also call, call attention to. Um, for me, I think this has the potential to do even more than these trends in terms of helping the state meet its greenhouse gas goals. Um, and that fourth uh, change is that Efficiency Vermont and the distribution utilities have really learned to work together. Tier three that I mentioned earlier changed everything. So you know, thinking back to when Efficiency Vermont was founded and we had these very clear, distinct roles, Efficiency Vermont was focused on the demand side, we're focused on customers and helping them manage and decrease usage. The utilities were focused on the supply side. Um, tier three changed that and now we both have to work together to help customers change their usage and change their behavior and their purchasing patterns and really help them rethink how they interact with their energy. Um, I'll be honest, that was a tough transition, right? We, we needed to work through a lot of complicating factors about how we would work together. And I think when we really came together and decided, let's put customers first, let's come together to figure out how to meet their needs, um, we had a bit of a breakthrough. And now, over the last 18 months to two years, you know, I think there's been a real advent of creative solutions that have brought more um, value out to customers, whether that's electrification projects that include a lot of efficiency upgrades, whether that's stacked in incentives that mean that customers can take on more comprehensive and transformative projects. So a lot of work has happened there that I think positions us very well for a different kind of a future. Um, based on that collaboration with the utilities, you know, we've learned an important lesson, I think, at Efficiency Vermont, and that is that we don't have to be the ones in front of the customer all the time. Uh, you know, this is an all hands on deck climate emergency that we're dealing with. Uh, we need everybody to be in front of customers talking about what they can do to reduce their energy cost and their greenhouse gas usage. And we've also learned that there are some aspects of the energy efficiency utility model that really do make sense to leverage going forward. I'm going to talk about those three things now. Um, one is statewide infrastructure. So um, over the last 19 years, ratepayers have invested in Efficiency Vermont and invested in the processes that we use to run programs and process rebates and the infrastructure to be able to have staff in almost every county of the, the state and go out and talk with customers and develop uh, relationships that we can leverage over time. You know, that's the kind of thing that, that doesn't make sense to rebuild. Um, so that's something that we've learned through these collaborations with utilities is that there's a lot that we can do together that makes use of that infrastructure to meet today's challenges. We've also learned that making use of the market transformation focus that Efficiency Vermont has is important and can provide a lot of value for the state. Um, so one example of that is a lot of the behind the scenes work that we do with the supply chain, I'll talk more about that in a minute, but things like incentives for manufacturers for bringing new equipment in, training for contractors, training for builders, um, going out and, and making sure that you know, quality assurance occurs and that we go back and when we find problematic projects that we go and we use that as a learning opportunity for the supply chain. So um, that approach and all of the work with the supply chain enables customers to come in and, and adopt efficient technologies at really high levels. And then lastly, a network of partners. And uh, one part of that that I'll mention here is Efficiency Vermont's um, and Efficiency Excellence Network. Um, that's a network of over 300 contractors, uh, designers, architects, and builders all around the state 
that have agreed to promote efficient technology. Um, they receive training for that. They receive marketing support. They receive um, customer leads, um, promotional uh, materials. And so you know, that's a group that we should leverage. You know, we shouldn't be rebuilding that as we think about our next energy challenges. We should be helping that established network um, to succeed and do the, the next things that we need it to do to meet our climate goals. So that brings us to today. Um, that's a lot of background about the learning that's happened and uh, where we've come from. Um, in terms of where we're going, um, I want to kind of take a moment and just give a little bit of the context about what's going on in the policy arena right now. Um, out of the last legislative um, year, the legislature in the past and the governor signed Act 62, which directs the Public Utility Commission to open up a study that looks at whether and how the state's uh, sponsored programs through organizations like VTrans or others, uh, and how the regulated utility programs in this state are working together to meet our climate goals. Um, and if there are gaps, to recommend to the legislature how those gaps might be filled. Um, so as part of that, you know, responding to Act 62 and participating in that study, which is open now, Efficiency Vermont has done some work to really reflect on the changing energy system, our experience collaborating with utilities, our experience serving customers, and um, we've come up with basically three tenets that are in our comments that you know, we would like the state to consider going forward. Um, the first is that we should be increasing collaboration to serve customers' needs. So this is something that you know, shouldn't be a surprise. We've heard uh, about collaboration, I think, uh, all morning from various ways. And you know, this is really reflecting that um, with the new challenges we face, we're going to need the best demand side expertise, the best supply side expertise to come together to solve customers' problems and to find the cheapest, quickest solutions to our climate challenges. And that we really can't find those solutions if we're both continuing to operate in different silos. Um, so we've, we've got that as really the number one focus of our comments. Secondly, um, we're talking about greenhouse gas emissions as the primary metric of success. This is what we'd like this, the regulations that govern Efficiency Vermont to move toward. If we did that, we would be aligned with the distribution utilities and their tier three goals to reduce greenhouse gas usage. Uh, we would both be focused on the most pressing need of our time. Um, so this really reflects that decreasing megawatt hours with efficiency and increasing megawatt hours uh, through tier three programs and electrification are somewhat at odds. And we need to really bring those two disparate goals together into a common metric of greenhouse gas reduction. And then lastly, um, our comments really focus on using the statewide infrastructure that I mentioned earlier um, and trying to use that as a backbone function for all energy programs in the state so that we don't have to build that again and again and again for different kinds of programs, but that we can make use of what ratepayers have already invested in. Um, so that's kind of the thrust of our comments. If the Public Utility Commission and the legislature move in this direction, and I recognize that's a big if, what that could look like would be uh, a redefinition of efficiency. Um, so we would see perhaps Efficiency Vermont's work shift in these various ways. Um, you know, one on the electric side, we could see more um, programs and efforts focused on uh, increasing customer adoption of control technologies so that then the utilities on the supply side could make use of those control technologies to shift and flatten peaks. Um, we might see more work within Efficiency Vermont to promote different technologies um, in different locations at different times to try and address some of the challenges that the utilities are facing with their grids. One example of that might be um, thinking about the increased um, penetration of solar in Addison County, for example. Um, you know, we could look across the state and say, okay, there's a ton of solar going on in Addison County. What that means is that there's gonna be a really big neck of the duck curve as all of that solar kind of ramps down at 9 p.m. on a summer evening. How do we help, how do we use efficiency to help the utilities with that neck of the duck? Well, gee, we could promote outdoor lighting in, in Addison County, and that would be the perfect efficiency measure to pair with all that solar on the grid so that the amount of energy usage needed once the sun goes down is as low as possible. You know, there's other things like that that we could do, and that's what maybe a transform definition of efficiency could look like. 
On the thermal side, um, if we're focused on greenhouse gases in the future, uh, I see us working a lot more with weatherization agencies and utilities to really double down our investments and our focus on weatherization, both for homes and buildings. Um, and then on efficient heating as well. So really trying to dovetail with uh, the utilities efficient heating efforts through tier three, trying to electrify heating, uh, but also bringing to the table work on advanced wood heating and other technologies as well. Transportation is an area where uh, Efficiency Vermont has not worked to date. Uh, in the future, if we're really focused on going after the biggest greenhouse gas reductions, the EAN report tells us that the state needs more effort there. Um, we need to do that in a way that is very careful and doesn't conflict with or compete with the existing utility tier three programs for electric vehicles. And so one of the things that we've been talking about with the utilities is, you know, is there a role that Efficiency Vermont could play there that would help you? And what we've heard back from several is that, gee, if, if Efficiency Vermont could work with the supply chain and help dealers get more vehicles on the lots and train the salespeople, that would be helpful. That would be a role that a statewide entity could do well. It would be a role that would support the tier three programs and not compete with them. Um, so those are the kinds of things we're talking about there. And then, you know, focusing on reducing greenhouse gas emissions is the number one priority. If that were the case, we would focus more on things like anaerobic digesters, working to make those projects a reality. Uh, we would focus on refrigerant management, trying to uh, move toward natural refrigerants and reduce leaks around the state. So there, there could be a redefinition here um, that would really position Efficiency Vermont to work with the utilities in a, a new and different way. The good news is we've got some experience doing that already. So I wanna just tell a quick story about coal climate heat pumps. Um, this just kind of demonstrates what can happen when the, the different energy programs in the state are oriented toward the same goal. So a few years ago, Efficiency Vermont began um, using its statewide infrastructure and supply chain expertise um, to go after coal climate heat pumps. And we've identified that the technology had promise. Uh, we have identified some challenges with its performance in coal climates. We worked with other organizations like the Northeast Energy Efficiency Partnerships and the Northwest Energy Efficiency Alliance um, to develop a specification for what, what cold weather performance would actually need to be in order for us to be able to promote it confidently to Vermont customers. Then we went out with those other parties, those partners, and met with all the manufacturers and said, here's what we're planning, not just Vermont, but with all these partners, here's what we're thinking about incentive levels and number of products we could move for you. Uh, but in order to get access to all of these incentives, you manufacturers have to meet this specification. And lo and behold, they played ball. They decided to do it. Um, then we got engaged with the distributors because we know when someone's boiler fails in January, the heat pump has to be available same day. Um, and so we got the distributors to stock the products by working with them and making sure that they were comfortable you know, stocking, they knew what they needed to do, they were not um, encountering any business risk in bringing these products in. And then we trained contractors uh, on what good applications look like and on you know, how to install these things so that we wouldn't have a lot of failures out in the field. We set up rebate processing infrastructure that was capable of quickly and efficiently processing thousands of units a year. Um, and then what most people saw is that we promoted these out to customers and provided incentives. So all of that background work, you know, that backbone work that I uh, just described, um, really set the stage. And then as Efficiency um, Vermont you know, promoted them and as the distribution utilities started their tier three programs, we had a really robust market to work with. Um, and then tier three programs came online. Efficiency Vermont has backed away from our rebates on that technology and the tier three programs have stepped in um, to promote that heavily themselves. So we're working together in partnership to really transition the market here um, and really you know, doing different things, having different kinds of roles that ultimately lead to a huge success for the state. You know, we're about the second per capita in sales of cold climate heat pumps in the whole country, second only to Maine. Um, that's a huge success and we would love to repl replicate that um, as we move forward through our energy transition. So I'll close now um, just by saying, you know, we know the urgency is real. We've heard that many times throughout the morning already. Um, you know, we have 11.2 years to dramatically reduce our emissions rate and bend the curve downward. Um, I'm optimistic because we have this opportunity now with Act 62 
to rethink how we deliver these programs. We have a baseline of partnership that you know, really demonstrates how we could work effectively together. Um, and you know, we've done some initial modeling. And if we changed Efficiency Vermont's portfolio to focus on greenhouse gas reduction instead of megawatt hour reduction, um, our initial estimates are that we could save three times the greenhouse gases that we do today. Um, so we have some opportunities in front of us. We're excited about Act 62 and really encourage um, everyone in this room to get involved in that. I see it as really um, a number one mechanism to start to shift our work and um, accomplish the greatest good that we can for the state of Vermont. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so with, uh, I have a couple of questions, and then I also want to let people know there are two microphones up near the front of the room. So if you'd like to ask a question, if you uh, just position yourself there, we'll get some audience questions in as well. So I wanted to start with, um, you know, it seems as though it's a uh, common sense effort to uh, shift energy efficiency work towards uh, taking on these other tasks. But there are, as you noted very briefly, there are some uh, policy and regulatory obstacles in the U.S. generally and in Vermont particularly that uh, are either preventing or slowing a transition into in doing taking on this work that many people agree they would like to take on. So, can you talk briefly about um, what those obstacles are? Sure. Um, I want to start by saying I think we talk about redefining and shifting of work, and I think that's important as a philosophical thing. Um, but it's also important to realize that many of these policies, even if there are barriers to this new work um, and many of the efforts we have, still have a lot of benefits to provide, even if it's not greenhouse gas reductions. So while decarbonization is an imperative that we need to act on and we need to increase our effort on, there are still benefits to get from traditional energy efficiency. And I think threading that needle of expanding our work in an effective way while not losing out on the benefits from traditional efforts is one of the biggest challenges I see. Um, I mentioned prohibitions on load building, prohibitions on fuel switching are barriers, but we adopted those policies for good reasons, that there was a fear that it would be uh, a misuse of ratepayer money uh, to allow utilities to go increase sales of a product. Um, there may be reasons we want them to do that, as we talked today. Um, they can provide a lot of benefits from doing that. But they, those activities still need to be providing benefits to the people who pay for them and in general. Um, as I mentioned, those are two policy barriers I know of generally. I am afraid I can't comment on the specifics here in Vermont. Um, great. Um, I think in terms of you know policy changes that would be needed to focus more on greenhouse gas reduction, I, I think there are a few. You know, one as I mentioned, we have um, policy mechanisms right now that put the utility tier three programs and efficiency Vermont's programs a bit at cro cross purposes, um, and yet both of us are going out to customers talking about um, changes they should make and whether those changes are you know increase efficiency or electrify certain end uses. Um, that has the potential to be very confusing. So I think breaking down the silos and then aligning us, uh, working toward the same metric would be a big step forward. Um, you know, in terms of the other piece that I think is important, I didn't focus on a lot in my comments, um, I think there needs to be a specific focus on low and moderate income Vermonters and other underserved, hard to reach groups like small businesses and seniors as part of this transition. Um, that's something that is um, carved out as part of the Efficiency Vermont portfolio right now. We have a certain focus on uh, low income and, and making sure that 
funding goes to that group and that they are part of the programs and can access those resources. Uh, and I think that that should be increased in the future and that we really should make sure that you know, those um, individuals who really need the most support to transition to cleaner energy technologies, um, that they get what they need. And it's, it's not going to be the same one size fits all program that uh, works for you know, someone who um, makes you know, a decent wage in Chittenden County as someone who's really struggling to make ends meet in the southern part of the state, for example. So I think that we need a specific focus on that challenge, um, specific attention to you know, how much of the resource goes to that underserved group. And um, I also think that we need to break down some of the silos between our different energy programs and align uh, the folks who are working out in the field with customers so that we're delivering the best, most um, cohesive and understandable message about what folks should do to change. Thank you. Uh, so a uh, question came in on, on the Rev app, um, and it relates to EVT. So uh, Efficiency Vermont has been justifiably recognized and celebrated for its uh, nation-leading status, all its innovation, decades of work. So anytime we talk about changing it, um, it makes some people nervous. The status quo has a certain power, uh, even though there's a lot of evolving uh, and surfacing challenges. So how do you uh, address the concern of people who say, I like that you're talking about taking on uh, greenhouse gas emissions, targeting them, but we don't want to lose what we've had and enjoyed and valued in energy uh, electrical efficiency? Great question. So, you know, to me, part of the, um, there are a few ingredients that have contributed to the success efficiency Vermont has enjoyed over the years. Um, one of those is a strong commitment, as June mentioned earlier, to data-driven decisions. Um, and so, you know, if we were to shift our focus from one metric to another, I don't see that going anywhere. I think we often actually get um, critiqued that it takes us a while to come to a decision about uh, what's the right solution for a customer, what's the right program design, um, but that that's really actually a valuable process that we go through in terms of deciding um, you know, what's a proposal that will maximize benefits out to the state and reach the right um, customer group with the right offer at the right time in the right way. Um, so that, I think, has been one of the facets of the successful programs that we've been able to roll out over the years. I don't see that changing at all. The other thing I don't see changing um, is a focus on energy cost reduction. So um, you know, this gets a little bit to the low and moderate income customer frame, but uh, you know, we, we have to focus on greenhouse gas reduction as a, a kind of climate imperative. And we know that in a state like Vermont that's economically challenged, um, we know that there's not a lot of extra money just sitting around waiting to be used on climate resources. So what I would like to see us do, which is what we have done for years, is really find those opportunities that can decrease uh, the cost of energy to homeowners, to renters, to businesses, um, and then you know, kind of instead of focusing on the intersection between energy cost reduction and electricity use reduction. Let's focus on the intersection between energy cost reduction and greenhouse gas reduction. There's a lot of overlap in those two Venn diagrams. And so I think that that's another you know, thread that would continue in the future um, that would make the programs that we offer and the types of incentives and the types of support and marketing and education, it would make it you know, feel very similar to today. Um, but in the background, we would be oriented to just deliver a different set of benefits to the state. Yeah. I'll just echo that. <clears throat> I think it's, um, sometimes we forget how much the work of energy efficiency is a matter of prioritizing actions there's a host of energy efficiency, of things we can do to invest in energy efficiency and an enormous amount of work that is done to analyze those decisions and pick out the ones that will provide the highest net benefit. And I think that analysis today is constrained by not having an um, ability to give full recognition to what benefits might be available in greenhouse gas reductions. But by adding that as an, an analysis, it's a matter of allowing those priorities to be set in a way that best reflect what we as a society are wanting. Great. 
Um, I have a quick question to the audience. Is anyone who's with an auto dealer, could you put your hand up? All right, so I don't see any hands. Could be, I haven't looked at the, all the, I don't know every program going on at the moment. Could be, there's one just for auto dealers next door, and so it's not a representative <laughs> sample. Yeah, transportation climate all right, there we go, so TCI. Uh, but the, the question, and, and back to the panel, is, um, uh, transportation-based greenhouse gas emissions are about 50% of our portfolio, um, and I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about, I think when people think of energy efficiency utilities, it's most often uh, thermal loads that we talk about or equipment installed in a, in a location. So can you talk about the, uh, the, wild, the wild world of transportation and how you're becoming a, a regular part of that? Sure. So I'll start by saying we're we're not a part of it right now, um, but that you know as as we've had discussions with the utilities about their tier three programs, um, we've also been following you know their work uh, not just on heat pumps but also on electric vehicles and um, you know looking at the customer incentives and how those are working and so we're we're becoming more um, aware of and um, conversant in some of the transportation issues. Um, and you know some of those that are covered by the electric vehicle programs that the utilities currently offer, and some that are not. So, one of the uh, things that I've uh, talked a bit with um, some transportation experts about is just the the segment of transportation demand management that you know is is not involved in the electric vehicle transition. So you know, there's, a, there's a host of different ways to uh, reduce greenhouse gases from transportation, including uh, switching to electric vehicles, yes, uh, but also decreasing vehicle miles traveled, increasing ride share, transit, um, bike, ped you know, work, um, downtown redevelopment so that people don't have to drive from their homes to their places of work, um, broadband again to echo June so that people can telecommute uh, without driving long distances. Um, so there's a lot of work to be done in the transportation sector. And I think um, certainly the transition to electric vehicles is a big part of that, particularly in a rural state like ours. Um, but one of the things that's exciting to me about getting an entity like Efficiency Vermont um, involved in the transportation work uh, would be that you know maybe we could look more broadly than just the electric vehicle option, um, you know, support the electric vehicle market as I talked about um, and work with utilities to help facilitate uh, their really effective programs to uh, taking hold with customers, um, but possibly focus on other areas of transportation that are not as uh, directly linked to the electric sector. Absolutely. <clears throat> it's exciting to hear about the collaboration work that Efficiency Vermont's already engaged in, um, because I think that is the heart of the challenge that we face in thinking about uh, electrifying the transportation sector. It's not an area that most utilities or even most utility regulators have a lot of exposure with, and it's a drastically different area. Consumers usually use electricity at their house or their business and in quite predictable ways. Um, but how consumers use transportation, how they get from A to B, what their constraints are on the time in which they can do that, the speed with which they can do that, the urgency of needing to get there um, are all different uh, aspects of consumer use that we need to be aware of. Um, we're seeing some work across the country trying to build on that collaboration and foster that. Um, I'm happy to be working, one of my colleagues is working on a paper he calls First Steps for States on launching into this, and I think one of the most important is recognizing that we have departments with a huge amount of exposure with this, transportation departments, and they also have very little background or understanding of the electricity system. The notion that there are spots on across the state that could be harder to connect to, that could be harder to provide electricity to, that there are, might be congestion on the grid, and difficulties in elect getting electricity maybe to that current depot where buses are parked overnight. Um, there's a lot of learning to be done there, but it starts with collaboration. Um, when we talk about this changing landscape, when we're talking about regulated utilities, uh, the process is 
somewhat straightforward in that if we change the statutes that drive the PUC process, then it changes the outcomes and how the utilities operate. But then there's a whole domain of unregulated fuels. And so can you, uh, dr of course, and they need to be part of this solution. I don't think of it as uh, sort of a zero-sum game in any way. How do we um, make that transition and include the unregulated fuels in a way that um, works out for all the stakeholders? Sure. Um, I completely agree. I think, like I said, all fuels efficiency is how we need to be approaching our efforts. And the only way we can get there that I can see is by having all fuels financing. Um, I think there are a host of different paths that we could take towards that, but it is definitely a challenge that we face. Um, but it's a, a very important one, both for economics and for basic fairness. Um, I wish I had better news. It's, I think, a challenge that we don't yet have that success story of, oh, that's how you do it. It's something that we're all struggling with um, here in this room and across the country. Unless you're not, in which case, please go to one of the Q&A microphones. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, I think uh, from my perspective, you know, yes, we've, Efficiency Ramana has done a little bit of research recently to try and uncover how other states are addressing unregulated fuels and what funding sources they're using and how they're delivering programs. Um, and I think what we've learned, is, as Joni said, there's, there is no silver bullet. Um, many uh, places, as Vermont, uh, are, are using um, either regional cap and trade mechanisms or other funding sources outside of electric funding or taxes on the fuels themselves um, to deliver programs. And the magnitude of that funding varies based on the magnitude of those um, the sources. So in California, the Western Climate Initiative, in New England, the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, or the Ford Capacity Market, um, those are our really uh, two strong sources here in the state. And those are being used in places like Maine, um, which has a very large percentage of its heating uh, through fuel oil. Um, so I think there's a, a desire to kind of come together and find an answer to this question. Um, Vermont may have an opportunity to start to um, explore and innovate in that, in that arena. Um, I was also, you know, I'll just note, very interested to hear recently um, an announcement by the Northeast Fuel Dealers Association that they're moving toward 100% renewable fuel oil by 2050. So um, I think there's um, some movement there as well. I think the fuel dealers are hearing uh, the strong desire uh, from their customers to be more renewable, to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Um, I want to find out more about that announcement, so I'll be uh, talking to Matt Coda about that very soon. Um, it really, but I think there's there's a need for um, some innovative solutions for that area. And I think we have a start here in Vermont based on what we've done to date, um, but there's more to be done for sure. And actually, uh, I think you mentioned briefly one aspect earlier, the competing panel we have on the Transportation mm -hmm. Climate Initiative, um, I think reflects some of that expansion. Um, there's conversations on trying to expand what Reggie covers to include emission sources that rise from transportation. Um, I have not been very involved with that, but it's exciting to see that move forward and to see that that might, we can hope, provide some amount of funds that could be reinvested in our communities to provide benefits, um, reflecting, uh, if not all fuels, at least a more fuels efficiency prioritize. Great. Well, thank you. Um, so uh, we, we are at time. Um, but before we uh, adjourn, I wanted to see if people still have our phrase in mind from when we started in the beginning. Uh, I'm going to say that I'm going to go through the phrase again. I hope that the two sentences. Hopefully, uh, I'm joined by more than three people in the room. <laughs> so we'll give it a go here, see if you remember it. So one is, uh, we have an environmental emergency. And number two is, using my training, I will take appropriate and necessary action. So today, we got a little more training on opportunities in front of us around beneficial electrification. Um, I hope that um, you'll keep this in mind as you uh, make your whatever your area of, of effort is in the world of uh, energy work and climate. Um, keep this in mind. And I know that our, all the partners in the room um, 
are interested in finding positive collaborations to help move forward at a uh, faster pace, more broadly, more deeply, than what we've been able to do in the last uh, decade. So thanks again, and please thank our panel, Rebecca Foster and Joni Sliger.